Now we begin with troubling news from Nigeria's North Central, where gunmen invaded Koro Town in Ekiti, local government area of Kwara State, killing the traditional ruler Oba Shegun Aremuko. It was gathered that the gunmen stormed the palace of the monarch around 7 p.m. on Thursday, fired gunshots which hit the traditional ruler. The wife of the monarch was also abducted by the assailants. This comes barely three days after two traditional rulers were killed by yet-to-be-identified gunmen in Ekiti State. Another suspected kidnappers late last night invaded the palace of Olukoro of Koro in Ekiti local government area of Kwara State, killing the traditional ruler of the town, General Shegun Aremu, retired. Now, the assailants also went away with the deceased wife and two others. The Nigerian police force says it has arrested 13 suspects in connection to the killing of two monarchs in Ekiti State, southwest of the country. The force public relations officer, ACP Muiwa Dejobi, on Thursday said that measures had also been taken to address the security challenge in the state. On Monday, gunmen killed two Ekiti monarchs, the Onimojo of Imojo, uh, Oba Olatunde Olushola, and the Elesun of Esun Ekiti, Oba Babatunde Ogunsaki, uh, while the Alara of Araikiti, Oba Debayo Fatoba, narrowly escaped. The traditional rulers were returning from a security meeting in Kogi State when they ran into an ambush mounted by the kidnappers who were operating on the highway between Ikpao and Okiako in the Kole local government area of Ekiti State. Now, with me in the studio to discuss this troubling issue is a public affairs analyst. Deemi Saka. Good morning, Deemi. Thank you for joining me on the news. Good morning. It's nice to be here. Now, Nigeria Southwest, which, you know, has largely exempted, uh, you know, has been exempted from the scourge of kidnapping, is actually now experiencing a wave of it. What do you think could be the reason for the crime wave in the western part of the country? I think we need to correct that Southwest has not been excluded, it's not been exempted, it was probably underreported. Um, to some of us that, you know, we hear news and people that travel around, it's a, even, it's a norm that um, Ikiti local government in Kwara State is after, if I'm not wrong, it should be after Egbe. If you're coming from Kaba, Kaba, Isan, Ijiba, Isanlu, coming down south to get to, um, for, along Kwara to get to Ikiti or Shun, coming down south. And it's a known fact that at some point, um, between Egba and Udoiri, Udoiri, in Kogi State is a flashpoint that till tomorrow you probably will not see anybody that wants to stay or step on the brake of his car while driving because of, you know, kidnappers there. And I, I, we don't want to, away from what people accuse a lot of people of saying it's, um, it's uh, what is it called? Profiling. It's not profiling. What have been, what are those people responsible for? Kidnapping along the axis are known to be Fulani kidnappers. We, we know it's it's a non, it's a it's a fact. And uh, if you look at the the geography, geography of where the Kitty killings happened and what have you, you know that Kogi State, by extension Kwara and Oshun, should be flashpoints or should be on red alert as we speak. And um, we know how it has been along Lagos Ibadan Expressway. We need to, if you want to curb these, if you want to confront these headlong, uh, head on, we probably should in, increase our what is called human capabilities, and that is human intelligence. We are where security agencies and agents across the country get the buy-ins and the confidence and collaboration. Well, okay, of in citizens. doing that, now, what what do you think the government is not doing right in trying to tackle this menace? Well, we, the government is not doing. A lot of things right and i'll tell you i think the first thing the government is not doing right is telling nigerians where they started from or trying to misrepresent or probably contain the reportage in a bit not to sound of an alarm you know panic bell and what have you but that's the truth if you don't know what's happening to us what's confronting us we probably will not know how to go about it two so, uh like i said i some months ago i said we're six months behind if you like we're in february now we're like eight nine months behind the, these kidnappers because um, the the untold hardship you know unleashed on Nigerians because of you know the initial policies of this administration is telling you know other Nigerians why some Nigerians is not out of not being patriotic but out of you know desperation for survival 
have collaborated with these um, criminal elements, giving them information, have become their foot soldiers. Oftentimes, you see, and that's evident. If you probably want to ask yourself, an instance in Cardinal State where a marked and identified terrorist um, location became a gathering, a religious gathering overnight when the military drone was going to attack a community in Kaduna. That's to tell you how much humans, when, I, when we say humans, it's human intelligence, that much humans has been compromised. It's not about the police, this is beyond the police. It's not about the military, this is not where you go both, you know, in the door. It's not a military affair, this part, this is an offshoot of what you call asymmetric warfare. This is an urban warfare, this is an offshoot of an urban warfare. And you need the collaboration of people, the citizens, to join you. Hey, hey, there, mate. Talking about the citizens now, we've actually spoken so much about you know what the government can do to curb the kidnappings. I, I seem to remember uh, a while back, I think a few years ago, where a particular governor was actually advocating for uh, citizens in the north. I think it was some for a state yeah. to own to start owning arms and everything so they can protect themselves and just yesterday i actually saw uh, a, an interview with uh, one of uh, the parliamentarian that's uh, ned Nwoko, you know sponsoring a bill for citizens to own arms so they can protect themselves from you know uh, the state of insecurity in nigeria since it's looking as if you know the government cannot do that what do you think that citizens can actually do differently to curb, you know, kidnapping or any form of insecurity in the country? Well, there's little or nothing they can do except just, you know, self or preserve themselves to stay alive. If we're confronting this disaster, there's little or nothing they can do. Now, they, let's go back to the Kitty incident. What happened? They happened at a place called Ayoshok. Ayoshok, that place has been notorious to be a bad portion when you're traveling along that route. For many years, that, road, that portion has been neglected. It's not the citizen that will fix the road. First, sometimes even when you want to fix the road, the local government will come and tax you or stop you from doing that. It's not the citizen that will, will prosecute, will work on intelligence gathered to, to break or smash a larger you know, criminal a, a syndicate or what have you. It's the police, it's the government. So, but for me, it's I think I was gonna I was I was driving out a submission. Mm. To end this, I think there's a need for us to look at the um, counterterrorism act, you probably need to come up with a counterterrorism outfit, not necessarily a unit as we have it, where you have some people in branches of the you know, paramilitary and military members of the city. You should have a city decentralized at every state where a state has its, its, its own command that can increase, you know. Are you talking about state policing or just, you know, uh, security outfits like the Amotekun. No, it's, it goes beyond that. It, uh, it's not about police. It's not a, a dedicated, a specialized counterterrorism unit. Most of you, you know, the field officers, intelligence officers probably will be drawn from existing, you know, um, institutions. But there should be a dedicated counterterrorism unit, decentralized at state level, where each state has its own state command, equipped with a lot of things, gadgets, and what you can think of. You should have what is called linked and alien cap capabilities, that is um, intelligence and what was it called, um, counter, counter counter measures, a lot of things that could listen is drop. There was, a, there, was an, there was a terrorist attack that could have happened after 9 11 in Dallas. And what, how that was foiled was because of the eavesdropping capabilities of the, the FBI then, I'm not giving them free advice. Yeah. yeah, and um, the, the, the code and the signal for that terrorist account, account, uh, attack was the wedding was going to old. That was a phrase that turned, you know, that their antenna caught and they was like, what was it? And they went out, uh, you know, ahead with the lead and they found a lot of, you know, they, because they knew they were on their trail, that was how they abandoned that terrorist attack. So we should do more of that and we should have central units that should be doing, and uh, decentralizing that should be doing that across the state level. Yes, they will be collaborative, you know, efforts with um, either the Amotekun, the police, the DSS, and the, the state, there's a garrison command if there's a state, if there's a military garrison in the install of all the operating bases. But we, had, we should not kid ourselves. This is beyond ordinary yeah. police work, and this is not to the job of the military. All right, well, uh, you know, some have actually argued that Nigeria's security architecture is not well equipped to tackle the squad of kidnapping or even, uh, you know, terrorism, uh, you know, in Nigeria, despite all the gadgets that, you know, have been bought and have been given to Nigeria. Uh, what is your position on this? Well, uh, I probably will not speak generally about our security architecture. 
that will, that will probably include the police, the civil defense, and what have you. But we want us to base it solely on the Nigerian military. That's the, that is the number four military strongest. When it comes to top ten, that's, it's on number four, sitting on number four in Africa. That's after Egypt, Algeria, and South Africa. So we've been tested and trusted even globally. I think what, what, is, um, what is messing up, if I can use that word, military operations and, you know, um, successes against this war on terror is the political will and what have you. Whether we like it or not, we should not shy away from, from what a lot of people call kuje break, prison break, which I would term as prison, prisoner swap. Um, we, we should look at that and tell ourselves that's responsible for the uh, of criminality. Sorry, why, do you, why did you term that as prisoner swap and not prison break? Because we all knew what happened. Don't pee on my face and tell me it's raining. It was after the kuje jail break, quote and unquote, the the of, um, people um, the kidnappers of um, the Abuja bound train from Kaduna released mm -hmm. their victims. So we all knew what happened. And where Kujé Kujé prison was so, is so strategically situated and located that those guys could have been engaged and neutralized. And they just walked in and walked out, created so much havoc, and nothing happened. A lot of commanders that should be spending time behind bars were freed, and a lot of criminal elements were released back into the society. And that's what that's the that's what that's the price Nigeria is paying through Abuja and the increase in mean, upsurge in crime in Abuja. So it's um and a, another thing we probably will say is the without um looking for or probably cutting his um his attention negatively, the National Security Advisor needs to wake up and probably sit up and do his job. He's not a politician. He should stop bothering himself about politics and do the right thing. The National Security Advisor should have a, we should have what is called a national intelligence officer in this country. We should have a national intelligence analyst in this country. When it comes to fighting terrorism and insecurity, there's something called mapping. Mapping is important. We should map that will tell us, that will give us, you know, uh, because most, oftentimes our reaction is, our response is reactionary. We should be preemptive. We should have solid, valid intel to crush these people even before they strike. So the National Security Advisor needs to wake up to his duty and try thinking of mapping out, you know, what is called um, his, um, his agenda. I probably, I've missed the name now for how he wants to counter the, the, terrorism, the terrorism facing us right now as a nation. All right. Well, uh, I think uh, this is actually where we wrap up this discussion. Thank you so much, DME Saka, for joining me on the news and speaking on this. You're welcome. Now, still on security issues, the sum of 100 million naira has been donated for the rehabilitation of victims of the Mongol violent attacks that left many people dead and several injured. The money was presented by the People's Democratic Party Governor's Forum when they paid a condolence visit on the governor of Plateau State in Joss. New Central's Chizoba Nyongwe was there and brings us this report. It's one week after the last attack broke out in Mangu local government area of Plateau State. Calm has since been restored by security agencies, but victims are still facing the aftermath of the incident. Groups and individuals have been visiting the governor to condole with him, as well as present financial and other assistance for the benefit of the victims. Most recent is the PDP Governors Forum, made up of 13 governors, but only five of them were able to make it for this visit. We will be with you to support you because we know that you are not sentimental. You don't show any signs. And because we have looked at all the issues on the ground, we urge you to be strong and to continue to dispense good leadership that the PDP governments are not for. We really bear with you with this uh, very sorry state that happened to the plateau. But it's not, it is a big distraction. But definitely we know you. We are not in some trouble. For him, the essence of state policing cannot be overemphasized if the security architecture of Nigeria will be reversed. We ask the Nigerian government to look at this crisis not as a secretarial or a sectional one, because this crisis has been linked on the plateau. We believe we should be allowed as governments to have step for this, because we know the nooks and crannies of this. Good governance means safety and security even before development. 
the late governor of Plateau, who commended the visit of his colleagues, called for concerted effort in restoring peace in the state. By the grace of God, we are not deterred. We are also trying to ensure that we build inter and intra community harmony. One thing I have said consistently since becoming governor is that nobody can go in the road. We need unity across the divides of faith, across the divides of ethnicity. If we don't achieve it, it's going to be difficult for the country to be secure. The governor maintained that if the series of attacks in the state are not addressed and treated as criminality, containing it will remain a mirage. In Jaws for New Central, I am Chizoba Anyui. Workers in Nigeria have demanded 436,500 naira as minimum wage as inflation continues to spiral out of control. Chairman, Trade Union Joint Meeting of the National Public Service Negotiating Council, Comrade Benjamin Anthony, made this proposal at the 2023 meetings of the separate and joint National Public Service Negotiating Council held in Goshen City, Nasarawa State, on Tuesday. The union argued that the current minimum wage of 30,000 naira has since been eroded by the high exchange rate coupled with the abrupt removal of fuel subsidy, which has translated into the high cost of living in the country, hence the demand for a new wage. Anthony, who was represented by the secretary of the union, comrade Boma Mohammed, also frowned at the recent delays in the payment of salaries by the federal government to workers saying the trend must be stopped and averts the repeat of such things as the suffering in the land is already unbearable. Now joining me on the news to discuss this is a labor lawyer, Ireo Lua Oguntu Ashe. Hello, Ireo Lua. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining me. Yes, hello. Thanks for having me. Happy New Month to you. Happy New Month to you as well. All right, so uh, can you tell us what significance do you think that, you know, uh, well, we all know that a tripartite committee has already been set up. Uh, what significance do you think a committee will have in coming up with a decent and equitable minimum wage for Nigerians? Okay, um, in even understanding the significance the committee is going to have, um, let us rationalize the reason the committee, you know, is there. Now, the, the reason the committee is there is because of the provision of Section 5 of the Minimum Wage Act, which states that um, when it comes to proposing a new minimum wage to um, the federal government, given the fact that minimum wage is in the exclusive list, there must be a tripartite committee which will consist of um, organized labor, organized private sector, and um, the government. Now, Section 6 further states that the representation, there must be a representation of all the three stakeholders in that particular committee. Now, let's talk about the significance of the committee. We all understand that the minimum wage is a matter in the exclusive list. And any matter in the exclusive list, it is only the federal government that can legislate on it, hence, you know, the Minimum Wage Act. So the implication of this is that um, there must be um, a representation mm. in all the sectors that relates to labor. For example, organized labor sector, the private sector, and the government. Now, the government and the organized private sector, they are all employers of labor. And we have the labor which represents the interest of the employee. So the purpose or the significance is just for them to meet, harmonize ideas as stated in Section 8 of the Minimum Wage Act, and come up with something reasonable as the minimum wage, given the rate of inflation and given the the economy, the 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 uh, the, the economy at that particular time. So, you know? in, in coming so up also... with 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 that, uh, how do you think that uh, the adjustment from thirty thousand naira to four hundred and thirty six thousand naira five hundred, you know, or four hundred thirty six thousand five hundred naira will align with the existing labour laws and regulations already in place? Well, um, okay, in, in, in even talking about um, existing labor laws, the, the only related legislation here is the Minimum Wage Act, like I said before. And the Minimum Wage Act does not state specifically 
-hmm. you know, in terms of increase or review of the minimum wage as contained in um, section three, subsection three of the minimum wage act, the minimum wage act doesn't state spe uh, specifically the amount of what the increase should be. And that is why we have the tripartite committee. But again, I believe that the reason should be allowed to prevail here. And when I say reason to be allowed to, to, to prevail, a lot of things has to be considered in determining what should actually be the minimum wage. And like I said before, they look at the rate of inflation and everything, and they also look at the ability to pay. Now, the reason I'm talking about the ability to pay is that, you know, um, in, 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 in talking about the employees that will be affected, we have employees of the private sector too that will be, that, that will be affected with this thing. Now, the question would be, if the government is saying they can pay, in which, sincerely, I believe that the government cannot afford it. I believe that the government cannot pay, and that's the defense they are going to come up with. What of the private sector? How possible is it for the private sector to pay? So those are the things that must be succinctly considered. So it's just a matter of reason. It's just a matter of reason. It, 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 it's, it's just a matter of the parties, you know, coming down to deliberate on how possible this thing is. But for me, I think from 30,000 to 430-something thousand, I don't think it's feasible. I do not think so. I don't think um, the representative of the private sector, employers like uh, Manufacturer Association of Nigeria, I don't think they would agree to that. And I don't also think that um, the, 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 the federal government, you know, in which their interests would also be represented, would also agree to that. Okay. Now, uh, Iro Lua, um, you know, as a labor lawyer, let's take a look at the role of labor unions especially in advocating for the minimum wage increase uh, what legal frameworks would you say support workers right to fair compensation and also leaving wages now you talk, you said you know from 30,000 to 400,000 you know is it really doesn't make sense so how much would you suggest that would actually be you know fair and equitable for workers in Nigeria well um is is a very technical question, but I'll just I would answer subject to my own opinion. Now, when 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 we talk about how much would be fair in these circumstances, let's talk about um, the general salary now that the government is paying. Now, let's talk about um, the challenges the government, you know, the, the challenges they are going through in paying that salary because we also need to understand that. A, 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 a lot of state governments have been finding it difficult. They've been grappling, you know, with the payment let's, of salary. Let's not also and forget also, that some of these state governments uh, uh, have not even been paying the minimum wage at all. And uh, from what we even just heard, you know, uh, some of them don't even pay on time. So even the uh, employees are grappling with a lot at the moment, especially with the removal of fuel subsidy and the, you know, high inflation rate and, you know, constant... Uh, you know, uh, everything is just going wrong. Yes. So, so now, if we put all these things into consideration, then we now need to come to an harmonization of the fact that what can the state government do? And when I say what can the state government do, what can they do? And they would ensure that they keep doing without not owing the employees. Because we, we, we all see um, the overriding effect, negative consequences, of what this thing is causing. We see increase in the in the wave of crime in Nigeria at the moment. But I agree with the fact that the minimum wage should be reviewed. Statutorily, the minimum wage should be reviewed, of course. That is, is, is even contained in the provision of the Minimum Wage Act, you know, section three, subsection four, that it should be reviewed every five, five years. But the amount that they are going to review it to, that is a subject matter of negotiation. And you know, you, you asked a question earlier and you said I should suggest um, what yeah. amount, you know, yeah. can, can will be convenient for the parties. Now, in suggesting an amount that will be convenient for the parties, I said a lot of things need to come into consideration. Now, if we're saying 150,000 minimum wage will be convenient for the parties, practically, we, if, if we consider the provision of Section 3, Subsection 1 of the Minimum Wage Act, that says that any employee should, affected by this minimum wage shall not be paid less than the minimum wage. So that means if we employ, for example, um, an office assistant in your company, you know, as, a pri as an employer in the private sector, the least amount you are going to pay that office assistant is 150,000. 
And this would also impact on, you know, a corollary effect on the amount that you would also pay other IR staff in the organization. So the question is, is this thing, is this thing feasible? For me, I would think that a review from probably the amounts now to like 100 or 120,000 can be feasible. But most importantly, the government also has a very big role to play. And the reason, the, 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 the reason I said the government has a very big role to play is that this agitation for increasing minimum wage from 30,000 to over 400,000 400, is coming on the heels of the economic situation in the country. So I'm thinking that in as much as the provision of the minimum wage is very clear on the review of minimum wage, mm. if the government can put concerted effort together to stem the tide of the of the negative um, economic implication in the country, then by extension to the labor would also step down on the increase, you know, astronomical increase in the demand for the minimum wage. All right, well, thank you so much. I really wish we had more time to discuss further, but thank you so much, Iri Olua, for joining me on the news and speaking on this. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, and do have a nice day. And now we move to politics, where stakeholders have called on the Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, Nyeso Mwike, to cease harassment of River State Governor Deminalai Fubara. They also oppose the prosecution of political allies of Governor Fubara, rather advocating a peaceful resolution. News Central's Ni Omoni has more on this report. The political tempo in River State seems to be rising, with the latest conflict in court rulings. One court nullified the 2024 budget passed by the State Assembly and signed by the Governor. Another court ordered parties not to take further action pending a ruling on an application to stop the representation of the budget. In the interim, the court acknowledged Speaker Martin Emewele led faction of the River State Assembly as accused Governor Fubara of misconduct and tyrannical behavior. This law does not award to the Governor any other power to do any other thing other than what it has said he should do. The action of the governor to go ahead and appoint someone and say the person is on, is on acting capacity and ask the person to resume is nothing but a violation of our law, a violation of the constitution, and indeed misconduct on the part of the governor. Observers say the latest crisis in Rivers marks a need for fresh mediation to resolve the rifts between Governor Fubara and former Governor Yesam Wike, now FCT Minister. Wike and his team must immediately cease the harassment, intimidation and persecution of this individual, whether through the misuse of the police or the judiciary. The people of River State deserve peace and stability. It is important for him, Mr. Wike, to understand that the presidency under Ashwaju leadership demand unity and loyalty from all. Governor Fubara and Wike have been in conflict over the state's political structure since October 2023, when legislators moved to impeach the former. The crisis leaving Nigeria's oil capital at risk even as the oil-dependent economy continues to deteriorate. We appeal to the Nigerian police as a professional institution to maintain neutrality and not allow themselves to be manipulated by any individual or group to cause unrest in River State. Law enforcement institutions must serve the people, not only individual or political party. We call upon them to investigate all allegations of wrongdoing, fairly and transparently ensuring justice prevails. The court will hear an application on February 28, 2024, to declare the seats of 27 lawmakers who defected from BDP to APC as vacant. For now, Governor Fubara enjoys his victory over APC candidate Toyako at the Supreme Court. In Lagos for New Central, Ni Omani. Welcome back and thank you for staying with us. Makoko is a 19th century Lagos slum, formerly a fishing village and one of the oldest slums in Nigeria, yet an area of startling patchy development. Exposed to low hygiene and sanitary conditions and extreme weather conditions, the people of Makoko are sitting ducks for climate change 
and its rancid effects on human health. New Central's Bettina Nweli reports. Since the Paris Agreement was signed by countries of the world in 2015, their commitment has spiraled, leading to various climate change actions and activities to reduce global warming. Yet, for the residents of Makoku, a waterfront settlement located on the coast of Lagos mainland, Nigeria's commercial capital, not much has been done to keep them immune from the disasters climate change brings with it. We didn't know about climate change before. You know, they let us know and what is the climate change. You know, our problem is here, the gutter always blocked because of plastic nylon. You know, once our women, our children buy a mini galas, beef and biscuits, when they finish eating it, they always drop it inside gutter. This is actually a sustainable development goals driven program uh, that addresses a number of the SDG goals, life underwater, uh, decent work, uh, good health, quality lifestyle. And uh, this is unique because it is sustainable in nature. Uh, the entire project is going to lift up more people out of the poverty line by ensuring that water from the portable water system is sold at much subsidized rates to re raise revenue to ensure this project leaves the, it, uh, this project spans the lifetime projected. If there was any doubt before, it is clear now how climate change is already affecting the health in the slum and everywhere generally. The World Health Organization has estimated from the current rate of epidemics caused by climate change that between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and heat stress. This raises concerns for more vulnerable populations like people living here in Makoku. The majority of the inhabitants of this community are fishermen, and we know that there are pollution issues in the Lagos Lagoon. And we also know that it is a neglected community and that we, we have also decided to give them very good portable water. The essence of me being involved in this project is to let people know that the responsibility of taking care of the environment is theirs. Because when you give to the, whatever you give to the environment, the environment will in return give back to you. In line with the SDG Goal 6, which is to ensure access to safe water and sanitation, it is hoped that government at all levels will speed up the provision of basic amenities and infrastructure that are lacking in this neglected community. In Lagos, for News Central, Bettina Nwili. Thank you for staying with us. Now the news continues in East Africa, where at least three people have died and 270 injured in a massive fire caused by a gas explosion in the Kenyan capital on Friday. Government spokesman Isaac Maigwa Mwawura said on X that a truck loaded with gas exploded, igniting a huge ball of fire that spread widely in Embakasi, a neighborhood in the southeast of Nairobi. Sadly, residential houses in the neighborhood also caught fire, with a good number of residents still inside as it was late at night. At around 6.30 a.m. local time, firefighters were set to be working to bring the blaze under control. United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, has appealed for peace during his visit to Port Sudan. Sudan's nine-month-old war has so far largely spared the country's east. But with the front line inching ever closer and reports of military training camps across the border in Eritrea, the fragile peace there is in jeopardy. Sudan's army chief, Abdul Fattah al-Burhan, has been fighting against his former deputy, Mohammed Hamdan Daglo, known as Hameti, who commands the paramilitary rapid support forces.
Economic Freedom Fighters leader Julius Malema and five party MPs are reportedly facing wage deductions for February as well as suspensions that will prevent them from attending the State of the Nation address. In an effort to reverse the suspensions, Malema and the MPs have promised to provide the Western Cape High Court with their pay stubs, accounts for school fees and personal spending records. Malema argues that without an alternative source of income, the financial losses incurred are significant. The EFF has uh, filed a new case contesting Parliament's new regulations despite their earlier denial of an urgent request to reverse the suspensions. The suspensions are as a result of their activities during President Cyril Ramaphosa's 2023 State of the Nation address, which led to a guilty finding for contempt of Parliament. Now, still in the rainbow country, in a joint operation, South African Department of Employment and Labor, together with Home Affairs Department and the police force, have joined forces to crack down on illegal activities at construction companies. This relentless effort aims to uncover and address a range of concerns from violation of labor laws, illegal migration to potential human trafficking. Now, the raids are being done in Johannesburg. New Central's Bongani Siziba gives us more. It was a busy day for the law enforcement agencies as they tirelessly pursued illegal immigrants through thick bushes. Amidst the thick foliage, the bushes couldn't contain both the police and those who sought refuge as the authorities were determined to apprehend those who hid away in the vast vegetation. One after the other, they were swiftly found and apprehended, and it was discovered that some of them were illegal and without proper work permits. There were uh, foreign nationals that do not have work permits to work in their country, and the number of them have been detained. It's quite a lot of them. I do not have their numbers now, but they are way above 35, and they are detained at the police station to establish their status in the country, but we suspect from the side of the Department of Home Affairs that they might be without work permits and as a result they have contravened not only immigration laws but also the Employment Services Act of the Department of Employment and Labor. The operation also included an inspection at the construction site by the Department of Employment and Labor where issues of health and safety were discovered. It's very pathetic because it's a safety and health issues that are not complied with. Their scaffoldings are not compliant and, uh, because they do not have edges. And unfortunately, they also dug a hole for electrical installation next to a scaffolding, which is dependable and can collapse the whole uh, project, uh, I mean, uh, system of scaffolding. So as a result, we are forced to prohibit the, uh, both sides. At the second site in Johannesburg, a task force arrived at a Chinese construction site with information about suspicious activity and suspected immigration offenses. As they arrived, something unexpected happened. At this construction company, police have discovered hidden rooms with more than 50 Chinese nationals who are working and staying here. The police believe that this might be a human trafficking case. However, they are verifying their documents to see if they are legal in this country. As officers descended onto the secret rooms, the gravity of the situation became clear. It was clear that language had become a severe barrier. It was evident that these people had no idea what was going on or how to identify local police officers including their uniforms, they appeared to be unaware that they were being arrested. Our, our sister department, the Department of Home Affairs, has established that there are a number of foreign nationals that might not be having documentation, which is also a contravention of Employment Services Act of the Department of Employment and Labor, because it says a person who works in the country as a foreign national must have a work permit that direct what is it the person must be doing in terms of the work that they will be doing in the country. The majority of them told News Central off camera that they left China after being promised jobs and when they arrived, the owner of the construction company took away their passports. Meanwhile, the Department of Employment and Labor says the operation will continue across the country and urges businesses to follow and comply with various labor rules. 
Law enforcement officials have also stated that they will continue their efforts to preserve order and defend national security. In Johannesburg, for News Central, Wongani Siziba. And now we move to business where the federal government has warned states and local governments to stay clear of the collection of royalties and taxes from licensed miners operating in their domains. The Minister of Solid Minerals Development, Dele Alake, who gave the warning in Kaduna on Thursday, said miners and operators owe the federal government more than two trillion naira and called on them to pay the debt. Alake, who was represented by the acting Zonal Mines Officer, Northwest Zonal Office, Kutman Ali, met on Thursday with members of the licensed minerals holders, laterite sand operators dealers in Kaduna. While explaining that the purpose of the meeting was to unveil the ministry's plan for miners and operators for 2024, the minister said in Kaduna alone, miners and operators owed the federal government over 300 billion naira. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, let's take another look at some of our top stories. We told you that gunmen have killed a traditional ruler and abducted his wife, two others in Kwara, North Central Nigeria. We also told you that South Africa's opposition leader Malema has challenged his suspension from parliament. And finally, you heard that at least three have died, over 200 injured in Kenya gas explosion. Send your eyewitness reports to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422. Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Darshan Usman.